Hi guys, I'm Matthew. I ended up as a homeless person almost without a dime to live on. But in fact, I had millions stashed away. Why did I do that and how did I get impoverished? I'll tell you everything in my story, but in the meantime, don't forget to like the video, write comments and subscribe to the channel. My last memories began in a hospital bed. The doctor's soft voice waking me up. Matthew, Matthew, wake up. I opened my eyes, but I couldn't move my body. I felt pain. It's okay. You're in good hands. You're in the hospital now. You had an accident, and we had to operate on you. Your head hurt, but the scary part is over, the doctor was saying. I didn't understand what was going on at all. And then two girls and a guy came up to me. They were hugging my legs and arms, saying how happy they were that I was alive. But I couldn't understand who it was. Do you recognize me? I slowly turned my head from side to side. And me? But no, I didn't recognize him either. I'm Lou, your sister. And I'm Connor, your little brother. Don't you recognize us? But no, I shook my head in a negative again. The doctor took them to the side and said that memory loss after such an injury was normal. Lou wondered how long it would be gone and if there was any hope of it coming back at all. The doctor said it would take time and good rehabilitation. After a week, I was discharged. Every day, my sister and little brother came to visit me in my room. They fed me and we talked for a long time, but still I couldn't remember them. I could not remember anything at all, except the fragments from the accident. I think I was driving somewhere with someone, and then a bright light, a collision, pain, and that was it. Lou and Connor took me home. We had a modest house. Turns out we lived very poorly. I asked the boys where our parents were and they said they were long gone, that we'd grown up on our own all our lives. What did we live on? We had a grandmother who left each of us some amount of money. Me and Connor spent most of it. Most of it went on your surgery. We lost your insurance, so we had to pay for everything. But we haven't gotten our hands on your share yet. She left you a lot more than she left us. Do you remember where the money is? We could use it right now. I... I don't remember anything. Don't worry, you'll remember, just rest. Time passed and I was recovering. Lou worked as a cleaner in the hospital where I was treated. Connor went to school and since I wasn't ready to learn, I stayed home for a few days. Three weeks went by just like that. I often asked if we had any family photos, videos, friends and other relatives, to which my sister replied that we were all alone and no one ever helped us except my grandmother. And how did our parents die? They drowned. It was an accident. My parents were great swimmers and they were really into diving. That's what killed them. How long have they been gone? A long time. About six years. I see. I wish I remembered them. They were great. Lou got held up at work. I'm going to go check on her outside. She said she'd pick up some dinner on the way. Yeah, I'm going to watch some TV. I went out on the porch to meet my sister, but saw her get a ride from some guy in a leather jacket. They were kissing and laughing, and then she got out of his car. I quickly ran into the house, and then we sat down for dinner. Lou said we really needed the money right now, and since I can't remember anything, she took off tomorrow and will go to the hypnotist. What can he do for us? Find out where you hid the money. Do you think it will work? It's worth a try, because we need it. You know, we'll live on it, just like we lived on my money and Connor's. Or are you against it? No, no, of course not. I'm all for it. The session with the hypnotist only awakened unpleasant memories in me, as if someone had stolen me. I was screaming for a long time, fighting back, and then some guy in a leather jacket put me in a car, and then a bright light, and three, I heard from the hypnotist. Awake? Yeah, but I don't remember anything useful. We got out of there, and Lou said that sometimes stress helps. My sister looked upset. I missed dinner that day. I was tormented by my nightmares the leather jacket, the accident, my abduction. No one was home in the morning. I decided to take a walk around town, but as soon as I stepped out the door, people broke into our house and started collecting our things. They said that since we had stopped paying the rent, it was time for us to get out. I tried to stop them, but all in vain. They just took everything out in 30 minutes and I was left on the street. I called Lou right away. She was crying so hard. Connor came in from school and was crying about how now they had nowhere to live. So I promised her that I would find the money. But I had nightmares in my head. 
We took our stuff to a motel. And in the evening, Connor and I got a call on our cell phone saying that Lou was a prisoner. And if we didn't get the money by morning, they would hurt her. Connor and I were so confused. I was mad at myself, hitting my head, trying to remember, but nothing came out. Then I made up my mind to rob the place. I left my little brother in the motel, covered my face with a mask, took a knife, and went to steal from small stores. Then I went into a gas station where I threatened and extorted money. When they pulled out a wad of cash for me, it was like I remembered something. Here, son, for your future. This money is your financial cushion. We'll hide it in the backyard of the house. Bury it by your favorite tree in your suitcase. Use it when you're in dire need. It was as if someone handed it to me, and I remembered what the house looked like. I left the looted money and ran wherever my feet led. Two hours later, I found myself in front of a beautiful house. It was deep in the night, and I climbed into the yard. I felt as if I had lived there once, but it was so strange. After all, my house isn't here. But you know, when I dug out the very suitcase I saw in my head, opened it up, and saw a million, I was just blown away. There were two more suitcases like that lying underneath. The first thing I wanted to do was grab them and run to give it all to Lou. And then I thought, this whole thing is weird. If we didn't have parents, why was the money being handed to me by a man? I remember exactly the phrase, here son. Then I started remembering more things. There were no clothes of mine in that house, not even a toothbrush, a mug. Weird. Did I even live there? I decided to sneak inside the house where the money was buried but everything was locked and the alarm was working. That's when Connor called, saying Lou was being threatened. I grabbed one suitcase and rushed out. I arrived at the designated place in the morning and saw a guy in the leather jacket standing next to Lou. And then it hit me. Did you find the money? Yeah. Give it to me before they finish me off. Lou, what's our dad's name? What? What's our dad's name? What are you talking about? Let's talk about it later. What? Bill, his name was Bill. You, you're not my sister. And the one in the leather jacket is your boyfriend, right? I saw you. You set this whole thing up. Where are my parents? Lou and the guy ran towards me, and I threw my suitcase and ran to get a cab. The two of them stopped in front of the suitcase trying to open it. Only I got the money out, hid some of it, and took the other for myself, and put some wood in there for weight. I took a cab to the hospital and asked the doctor for my information. She didn't want to tell me, but I promised her 10 grand for the truth. Yeah, they're not related to you. Lou and her boyfriend brought you in. She works here. She's known me for a long time. I gave you some treatments, injected you with something for your memory. There was no surgery. You just bumped your head in the accident. Who are my parents? I don't know. I just know you're rich and your folks are rich. You certainly didn't live in our neighborhood. I asked her to give me the antidote shot to restore my memory, and she did. I lay there for about 20 minutes, and when I went to the mirror, I realized that I had different hair color and was wearing glasses, even though I never wore them before. I gave the doctor another five grand on top for keeping quiet and left. As I drove closer to the neighborhood from where I took the money, it was only then that I noticed the wanted posters on the trees for Matthew Farrell, the red-haired boy without glasses, which was me. I had been wanted for over three months. I knocked on the door and a woman came out. She yelled, Matthew! Mr. and Mrs. Farrell, Matthew, it was our maid. Anyway, of course, my parents went to the police. These teenagers weren't even siblings to each other. They were always up to their old tricks. Lou's boyfriend and herself stole me on the way home, drugged me, and then we had an accident. In the hospital, while I was half asleep, I blabbed about the money, and the guys decided to reverse the situation and not demand a ransom, but to make sure I got the money myself but the plan changed and everything went the way it was supposed to go. Now the three of them are waiting for justice and I transferred all my money into the bank and asked my dad to help so that if anything happens, I can't have access until I turn 18. I'm a billionaire, but I live in an orphanage. Hello everyone, my name is Elliot. I have a lot of money, but I live in an orphanage and all because I decided to run away from home. It seems to me that money has ruined my family a lot. Things have become much worse than before when we were not so rich. Now I'll tell you everything and don't forget to put like and subscribe to this channel and write your opinion in the comments under the video. When my parents and I lived in a more modest house, we didn't have much, but in principle, we'd had enough for food, clothing, and accommodation. My mother raised me as a kind son and I was always happy with what we'd had. I wanted more, but I believed that everything would come in time. And as it happens, when you suddenly find money, it blows your head off.
I'd heard of it before, but I didn't think it would ruin Mom and Dad's character too much. One day, a man came to us. He introduced himself as a lawyer and told me that I was their heir to a large fortune. My grandfather, whom I'd never met, left a business in real estate in my name. It was my father's father. For reasons I don't understand, they haven't spoken in years. So after his death, which also turned out to be news, he also made me their heir. My father was surprised. He didn't think he would do that at all. And since I was not 18, my father was in charge of everything. Mother and father were happy with the money, and the first thing they did was change the house, buy cars, and father quit his job, and then went on with his grandfather's business. He spent all day at work, it was difficult for him, and my mother volunteered to help him. And now, they were out late at night, and I was hired a babysitter. The house became quiet. Considering that our new house was the size of a palace, the silence was jarring. Our new servant, Nanny, and I were in it all the time, and I felt lonely. There were no more cool fun dinners, no more board games, no more walking. No more reading fairy tales. All the conversation and thoughts of mom and dad were only about business. No matter how much I asked them to stay with me, they had one excuse. They had to work. I knew it was important, but is it really that hard to set aside just one hour to remind me that they're my parents? The offense was saved and rose, and then I took action. As my birthday approached, I planned an evening, prepared games, books, and even chose a movie to watch. Mom called me and congratulated me on behalf of herself and dad, and then said that they would come home in the evening with a gift. I don't need anything, just come by yourself. I had said to my mother, and all I heard was, we love you, and then she abruptly hung up. I, without losing hope, came quickly from school. The nanny helped prepare dinner. I took part in it myself. I wanted to surprise my parents. We made my mother's favorite apple pie and turkey in the oven, just like my father likes. I set the table myself and sat waiting. An hour passed. Then two. My dinner was getting cold, and my hope was slowly turning into tears. Even though I was a boy, I was terribly offended that they did this. I called again, but they didn't pick up. So I wrote a message sent a photo of the table. My mother read it, but she didn't say anything either. Then I got up and went to my room to sleep. The next morning, I saw my mom and dad discussing something. They were in deep conversation and didn't even notice that I was standing next to them. Good morning, I said softly. The mother came up to me and kissed me. Happy birthday, son. I'm sorry we came back when we were already asleep, she said. Nothing, I said, and sat down and drank my tea. My father kissed me on the forehead and gave me a gift. There was a game console, which I did not want at all. I smiled faintly and said, thank you and then put the gift away. My dad was annoyed. He suddenly started scolding me, calling me ungrateful. Everyone dreams of one, he said. Then I broke down and exploded. Told him everything I felt. My father was so angry that he called me a bad boy. Said that many children do not even dream of what I have. But the most annoying thing is that when he told me that I don't appreciate the parental efforts. If you lived in an orphanage, you would immediately see how the children live there. How they starve and want a family, the father said. I memorized these words and went to school. It was the worst birthday of my life. I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to see my father. Suddenly, in the middle of the lessons, an idea came to my mind. It became so obvious and stuck in my head that I came home, packed my things, and left while no one was looking. Wandering the streets, I was looking for a new home, an orphanage, just like my father had said. I wanted to show him that I could survive in such conditions, and also, I wanted to reach out to him, to show him that only by losing, you understand priorities. I found the nearest orphanage on the internet. It was in a neighboring city, many kilometers from home but it didn't scare me. When I got there, of course, they wouldn't let me in, but I lied and said I was lost, that I didn't remember my first name or my last name. These were my extreme measures. The director was going to call the police, but I turned on the actor, cried, and said that I wanted to eat and sleep, and they left me for a while. Then the director was abruptly called to another city on business trip, so I won some time. They showed me a room, took my things, and gave me another one. It was worn out and smelled of bleach. I felt uneasy from the looks of the guys. Everyone looked at me with interest, like where I came from clean and good clothes, I stuck to the legend of memory loss, and it helped me. To be honest, I really didn't think about how difficult life is outside of home. The first night I went to bed almost hungry, and I couldn't eat the soup they gave me in the dining room. And then they showed me my bed. It was a common room among 18 others of the same kind. Someone snoring, talking, and even farting disturbed me. And yet, this is a hard mattress. It always seemed to me that something stinks. There was a smell of damp, dirt everywhere. A couple of times, I think I heard mice running around. I was scared, disgusted, and I thought about giving up the idea, running away from there. But my father's words that I should have lived in an orphanage didn't go out of my head. So I stood my ground. About a couple of days later, Stuart came up to me. Our beds were nearby. He said he saw an ad with my picture on it. He showed it to me, and I snatched it from his hand. He asked me what I was doing there, if I had relatives, but I said it was a long time to explain. Well, we have a lot of time here. We can't go anywhere from here. He said, I promised to tell him after dinner on the walk. Are you an idiot? He asked. That was rude. I just said I just wanted to teach my father a lesson. 
you idiot. This is no longer a question. Do you have any idea how many kids there are just like you who want to live like you? Just because your parents have celebrated one birthday with you in 15 years doesn't mean they don't love you. They have a real income, which they now hold on to. This is normal. You just have everything. Don't need a set-top box? Give it to us, said Stuart. I looked at him in silence because I felt ashamed, and suddenly I realized that I had done something wrong. But it was as Stuart had broken through. He went on to say that there are lots of kids around us right now who just want to live like somewhere else. Not to mention a mansion, loving parents, and gifts. If I had such ancestors, I'd be glad at least that I have them at all. And I probably would not have asked for any attention or gifts. It would have been enough for me that I live with him, go to school, and eat well. Do you know what I mean? Stuart asked, and I nodded in response. Then he said that my father was actually right. I was just being rude. But as far as I was concerned, I was wrong about everything. I said I had no idea how to get back. And then he pulled the ad out of his pants and opened it in my face. Call them, he said, or I'll do it. I listened to him and called my father, and he and my mother immediately came to pick me up. There was no face on it. My mother accused him of saying such things to me at the time. It turns out that they were looking for me all the time, but they didn't even think that I would go to an orphanage. They fought to the point where they had almost got divorced. And when we got home, I said I was really sorry. And my mother promised that now she would look for time to be with me. And that was enough. That's how my adventure ended. What do you think? Was I right or wrong?